to the Network Commons. This is the Build Healthy Places Network's live discussion series on cross-sector strategies to improve neighborhood health and well-being. I'm Colby Daly, and I'm Managing Director at the Build Healthy Places Network in San Francisco. Today, I have the honor of serving as the moderator for our discussion on how Community Development Finance Institutions, or CDFIs, serve as an action arm for health equity, revitalizing low-income neighborhoods to improve opportunities for all. CDFIs are part of a more than $200 billion community development sector that brings public and private investment into place-based initiatives. As of 2015, there are nearly 1,000 CDFIs serving cities, rural areas, and Native American reservations nationwide. I am particularly excited about today's conversation because we are featuring three local leaders spanning community development, public health, and healthcare, who are all in the midst of deepening their relationships with CDFIs as a result of their participation in Build Health Challenge and the network's Joining Forces grant program. You can read more about both programs by following the links that will be posted in the chat, but I'll provide a quick uh, brief background now. The Build Health Challenge is a multi-funder collaboration that is supporting 18 communities that are collaboratively taking bold, upstream, integrated, local, and data-driven approaches to moving resources, attention, and action to the primary determinants of population health. In order to drive sustainable change in the improvement of community health and promotion of health equity, the Build Health Challenge seeks to increase the number and effectiveness of hospital community public health collaborations, and the program is jointly administered by the Kresge Foundation, the Advisory Board Company, De Beaumont Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Colorado Health Foundation. The Joining Forces Grant Program was established by the Build Healthy Places Network with support from the Kresge Foundation to help build grantees explore partnership opportunities with CDFIs in their ongoing efforts to improve health equity in their local communities. The network established this grant program with the understanding that by joining forces, CDFIs and BUILD grantees can have even greater impact improving communities and the lives of people living in them. These planning grants give them the resources needed to explore concrete ways to partner. <clears throat> We've asked, been asked by various colleagues, as a public health or healthcare practitioner, how do I begin a conversation about partnerships with CDFIs and other community development partners? Who do I contact? What value can cross-sector collaboration bring to local health equity efforts? Today, we're lucky to be able to answer these questions straight from the source. I'm happy to introduce three local leaders representing this year's Joining Forces grantees who will share their firsthand experiences working with regional and national CDFIs and lessons learned for the field. I'm particularly excited about this group of speakers because not only do they represent three different sectors, community development, public health, and healthcare, but their organizations all are what we call community quarterbacks in their own right. In other words, they've cracked the code in figuring out how to effectively serve as a coordinating agency for cross-sector health equity initiatives in their respective communities. These are exactly the kinds of efforts that we as a network aim to lift up to help forward the movement of cross-sector collaboration. You can read details on the full backgrounds of our speakers by clicking on the links that you'll see in your chat, walk, chat box, but I also want to provide some brief introductions. First, I'd like to welcome Jennifer Hadaya. Jennifer is joining us today from Houston, Texas, where she serves as Senior Policy Planner and Health Equity Coordinator at the Harris County Public Health Department. Jennifer has over 17 years of public experience overseeing clinical preventive programs, community coalitions, strategic planning, social marketing campaigns, evaluation initiatives, and policy systems and environmental change efforts. With support from the Build Health Challenge and the Joining Forces Grant, the department is developing a healthy, food a healthy food financing plan that explores how to scale up and replicate an urban farm to improve food access in an underserved community in Pasadena, Texas. Thanks, Jennifer. Next, I'd like to welcome Michelle Melendez. Michelle is the Development Director for First Choice Community Healthcare, a federally qualified health center 
or an FQHC in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Michelle develops resources and strategic partnerships with community leaders, business leaders, governments, local organizations, and innovators. Through the Build Health Challenge and Joining Forces grant, Michelle is leading the development of a business plan for its South Valley Commons expansion project, which will include an early childhood development center, health professions charter school, wellness center, teaching farm, and farm to table restaurant commissary. Thank you, Michelle. And finally, I'd like to introduce Jay Mankara. Jay is president and CEO of Develop Springfield, which is a nonprofit organization that advances development and redevelopment projects, stimulates economic growth, and expedites revitalization in Springfield, Massachusetts. Jay has worked in planning and economic development in New England for more than 25 years, and the Build Health Challenge and Joining Forces grant will support Develop Springfield's ongoing effort to develop funding and financing alternatives to help attract a grocery store operator into an underserved area of Springfield. Field. Thank you, Jay, and thank you all for coming. We're really pleased to have you join us here today online. <clears throat> so I'm going to kick things off with just a few questions for our speakers, but I want to move quickly to our audience and leave plenty of time for Q&A. In fact, we received a tremendous number of questions from you um, in advance of the event. So I want to thank all of you who submitted your questions earlier while registering. And for those of you who want to share questions or comments now, you can use the chat box that shows up on the side of your screen. We'll be following Twitter so you can send us uh, and the rest of the world messages that, uh, that way too by using the hashtag uh, network comments, all one word. And we'll try to get to as many of your comments and questions as possible. So let's start with the first question. Um, and I'd like to open today's discussion by asking each of our speakers to briefly discuss health equity goals uh, within their respective projects. Jennifer, let's start with you. Please tell us a little bit more about Harris County health food financing plan that's underway and how it has forwarded the department's broader health equity goals. Thank you, Colby, thank you, Colby. And, and thank you to the Build Healthy Places Build Network for supporting our work and providing an opportunity to share our lessons learned and today. To start, to start our, agent our agent is with the Little County Health Department County for Harris, Harris County, County, Texas, County, Texas, and we serve a jurisdiction of about 2 million, about million people. people. In our most in recent our strategic, most strategic plan, plan, we adopted we health equity as, as an explicit goal for our department, department and then began an organization-wide transformation of our policies, programs, workforce, and data to reflect health and health goals. goals. Our approach our is to what we, we call the four E's, economics, economics education, 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 environment, environment, and engagement. And our Build Health Our Challenge Build Health is the first equity-specific project that we launched after making this deliberate shift in our priority. Briefly, Briefly, our Build, Build Health Challenge aims to reverse nutrition inequity in an historically disinvested neighborhood in Harris County, one which is now a food desert and facing the highest rate of child care in the community. Our solution, Our solution is to stand out the area's area first source of local grown, grown produce, produce, a combination, a combination of indoor vertical and green, and green, 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 green which will be linked to area grocers, grocers, grocers food, 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 and, food and, and residents, residents thereby forming a complete local food system for the neighborhood. The farm will also hire locally and include a classroom for testing agriculture technology to make our Healthy Our Food Finance plan, plan, which was funded through joint forces, is a comprehensive business plan for the farm. It answers core questions about the social, economic, and environmental benefits of a local food system, as well as how to finance and sustain those benefits in a way that is community engaged. These are some of the same core questions that we, as a local health department, ask about addressing health and equity in general. And ultimately, we hope to use our business plan to replicate the build food system model in other disinvested neighborhoods in Harris County. Our specific role in developing the business plan is aligned with public health's role in general in community health improvement efforts. We served as the convener or quarterback, as Colby said, of the business planning process, identifying and engaging partners. And we used our community coalition building experience to ensure that residents and stakeholders were truly informing the plan. The work we did to strengthen collaborations and engage the community also furthers our health equity goals as a health department. 
Great, thank you, Jennifer. And Michelle, similar to Harris County, First Choice incorporates a holistic understanding of health into its work as a clinic. What were the drivers of the South Valley Commons project and how does it fit into First Choice's broader health equity goals? And I wanted to say um, thank you for letting us know there might be an echo. Um, please continue to let us know if you have any issues listening to, um, listening to the broadcast. Thank you for having me, Colby. And do let me know if I have that echo. Uh, I know it was hard to hear. Um, First Choice was established in 1972 by activists in a low-income community in Albuquerque called the South Valley. And it's very much an agricultural community and predominantly Hispanic and has been really suffering disproportionately from inequity for a very long time. And the organizers, were then part of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement and really knew then what we know now, that health is about a lot more than just the clinic visit. And there were no clinics, so that's how we got started. But alongside that, we really understood that health was just as much about early childhood education, about high school graduation, about workforce development and opportunity to get good paying jobs. And so we know that health is really only about 10 to 15 percent can be attributed to the medical care visit. And we're very lucky to have very forward thinking providers and doctors who know just that behavior where choices people make about what they eat and the, the kind of lifestyle issues that are, are blamed for chronic disease, that those are really tied to what is available in the community and what choices people have to choose from. And so um, New Mexico and Bernalillo County where I'm at has a very robust community health council that does health needs assessments and has prioritized ending poverty, providing better jobs, providing early childhood development services to the communities who need it the most. And it was that backdrop that really informed First Choice, which conducts its own health needs assessment as an FQHC uh, every three years. And uh, with that context, First Choice's board began investing in land around our South Valley Health Commons a few years ago. And we've now come to call that development, it's a community development, a wellness ecosystem. And it's going to have an early childhood development center, uh, a permanent campus for a health charter school that's already in its fourth year that really tries to steep these young people in the ethos of community health. It's not a training school that teaches people necessarily how to take blood pressures. It's much more than that. And we also have a workforce training center planned. We have an existing one that serves our employees, but we're going to expand that to one day take in the graduates of this health leadership high school as well as community members so that they can compete for the growing healthcare jobs, which is one of the only growing industries in our community. And also a food hub and a farm to table style restaurant. And these components were really driven by community dialogue. So for example, when we were first contemplating a community farm, what we learned from the existing farmers and farmers markets was that what was needed was a food hub to aggregate, process, distribute, store vegetables to start to really serve a much larger market and create jobs in the process and make it sustainable to become a farmer again. So um, that's how our plan began to really take shape. And uh, independent economic analysis has found that the project creates 181 permanent jobs in our community and generates $135 million in economic activity over the first 10 years of the project. And that's not even counting the construction jobs, which would generate an additional amount. And we're talking about 400 high school students really getting immersed in our community health uh, movement every year. 60 babies and toddlers would be served in our dual language early childhood development center. We're talking about growing 200,000 pounds of food organically that creates lots of distribution and packaging and, and other kinds of jobs. And this directly addresses the 32% poverty rate in this community and the unemployment rate that's 10% of our community. Um, we're talking about 
per capita income that is only 57% of the national average. So we have a long way to go. And ultimately what we're trying to impact is the 13 to 16 year difference in life expectancy that this community has compared to more affluent census tracts in other parts of Albuquerque by focusing our efforts, community development efforts that paired with a community health center like ours um, in our South Valley. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Michelle. And um, I'm getting an echo. Um, Jay, you, let's go to you. You come from a non-health field, but you're working on a larger project with implications for health and well-being in Springfield. Can you share more about how Develop Springfield is approaching the development of grocery store as a broader health equity initiative? Yes, well, first let me say I feel a little humbled following Jennifer and Michelle. Um, but just kind of a little bit of background for those who aren't familiar with Springfield. Uh, city of Springfield is located in Western Massachusetts. We are the urban center of this region. Uh, Springfield is about an hour and a half west of Boston, about two and a half hours northeast of New York City. So we're really too far from either of those kind of major magnets of development to really benefit from them. We are a city that has been struggling to adapt to a post-industrial era. So kind of within that context, what people uh, realized is that in order to set, you know, our own future, to establish our own future in, in Springfield, we needed to come together uh, with a kind of a cross-sector alliance of government, nonprofits, our major employers, and community-based organizations to basically take charge of our own destiny. So back in 2008, there was a plan that was done for what's the major corridor, State Street, uh, running through Springfield, which developed a number of different development priorities uh, for the corridor. Uh, and the sense was at that point that what the city needed was a private nonprofit partner to help stimulate uh, or drive these developments. So that's when the Belt Springfield was formed. And so early on, that kind of set a roadmap. And we primarily focus on planning and on bricks and mortar uh, redevelopment projects. So the supermarket in the area known as Mason Square was one of those early initiatives. So of course, as a development corporation, we approached it initially as a development project. Um, but of course, the project itself was rooted in community health. The primary goal has been to improve disparate health outcomes in a high poverty uh, community, largely Latino and African American, particularly with respect to obesity, diabetes, and, and hypertension. So that was kind of the starting place. I think as time has gone on and working with our community-based partners, we came to increasingly appreciate the importance of the health aspect of the project and really saw this as an intersection of community development and public health. So that's kind of driven everything that we've been doing moving forward. So we look at this project uh, in, in a few different ways. First, of course, and foremost, as I mentioned, it is a public health initiative. This is about improving health outcomes by providing enhanced access to fresh and healthy foods in an urban food desert. So that's first and foremost. But here's also an economic development project. It would bring needed jobs to this community. At this point, we're estimating around 110 to 120 jobs. Uh, so critical. It also helps keep money in the community. Right now, about 40% of the residents in the area are uh, transit dependent, lack access to a private automobile. The remaining 60%, of course, do have access to an automobile, but whether they're driving or they're taking public transit or unfortunately very often taxis, they, the dollars that they're spending are leaving the community. The dollars that they're spending on groceries are leaving the community. So this helps bring that back. It also brings significant investment to the neighborhood that has long been, or should, I should say long has been suffering from disinvestment. And also very importantly, particularly for that 40%, the people who are frequenting uh, corner stores, local pharmacies uh, to access many of their groceries and purchase their household goods are paying proportionally a higher percentage of their income than they need to be on those basic commodities. So this also helps improve the economic conditions of area residents by keeping more money in their pockets. So that's critical. We also see this, of course, as a redevelopment project. That was our starting point. The site for the ministry store will be located in an area that's suffering from high vacancy, uh, you know, vacant buildings, blight, 
underutilized properties, surface parking lots. So this would, uh, we believe, help stimulate investment in this area and attract other goods and services, which kind of relates to that point. Um, this is also a social justice issue. For people who live in this, especially long-time residents in this community, they can remember a day when there were multiple grocery stores in the Mason Square community. There were department stores. People in this neighborhood could access a wide range of goods and services that over the years have largely disappeared and gone to outlying suburban communities. People within the Mason Square community are looking to have access to a comparable range of goods and services that people enjoy in more affluent areas. So all of these are kind of the key guiding principles that drive us in moving forward this initiative. As with everything we do, we always look to meet multiple community goals with you know, any individual project we undertake. Right. Thank you, Jay. And I want to point everyone to um, each, uh, Jennifer, Michelle, and Jay have written blogs in more detail about their Joining Forces grant and um, for links to those in the chat box, and you can find them on our website at buildhealthyplaces.org. So just to go into our second question, um, as I mentioned, here at the network, we focus on the role of community development, a $200 billion sector, as an action arm for health equity through development and financing of affordable housing, schools, grocery stores, health clinics, and the things you heard about just a few minutes ago. CD advisors are becoming more aware of the health dimensions of their investments, and now increasingly they are partnering with public health, healthcare, and other partners in local projects. So next I'd like to hear from our speakers about how they forged connections with CDFIs and how they have forwarded their respective programs. Um, Michelle, let's start with you. Can you share more about how you've connected with regional and national CDFIs during the past year and what's come out of these new connections? Sure, thank you. Um, a few years ago, I, I knew that we had a few CDFIs in, in New Mexico, and they're very well known for small business loans and very valued, but um, not for the kind of development that we are talking about. So it wasn't until the Build Health Challenge came out that we saw a grant opportunity that recognized the need for capital to help support community health efforts like ours, in addition to the program dollars that they were offering. So by becoming a Build Health Challenge grantee, they connected us with the Housing Partnership Network out of Boston. And um, we got to go through a pre-underwriting process, which was a real eye-opener for us. Mm -hmm. And um, that process really started asking us very good questions that we needed to go through about our own business plan and the scoping of the project what we could afford to borrow, what we needed to raise privately. And um, the most uh, interesting question was, are you going after new market tax credits? And we're like, what are those? You know, just hadn't ever even thought of those, didn't know anything about them. And so I think the Build Health Challenge folks really recognized our relative inexperience with this kind of a financing mechanism. And so they asked us if we wanted to go to the Opportunity Finance Network Conference in Detroit last year. So I went along with our board chairman and we got a, a huge education in those few days about this entire world, the sector that shares our mission, shares a lot of our values. And we just thought, where have you been all our lives? You know, we found a new potential partner out there. And uh, the Joining Forces grant uh, became available to us. Build, Building Healthy Places Network organized a very special breakfast where we could sit down one-on-one -on -one with several CDFIs, tell them about our project, and several of them were interested and thought that it was a, possibly a good match. And so after that conference, they actually included our project in some of their applications for new market tax credit allocations. And we still knew that we knew very little about this complicated and complex uh, financing mechanism, and we wanted to explore more. So I came back home and we started talking with some of our real trusted advisors. Um, we talked to people in the municipal bond market, and uh, they connected us with their colleagues at corporate headquarters here and there. And because there really was very little of that kind of activity happening in New Mexico, we're a very low income state, a very poor state and haven't had this kind of investment much before. And so um, 
we got to talk to some of the premier experts. We I sat down with Novogradic by phone and we started asking who should we go to and we got a long list of potential applicants to to basically consult with us using the joining forces grant money that we were given to start to pursue this line of financing and we each of the interviews was an education in itself we just kept learning about what this opportunity really entailed what it would require of us and how we could start to become ready once the allocations for new market tax credits would be made and um, we ended up you know, we interviewed about seven different consultants across the country, narrowed it down to three, and um, finally selected Capital Link as our consultant. And um, that we also became aware of the Healthy Futures Fund Readiness Project, which would take that consulting the next few steps that we needed to, to go in our financial health of our organization, in business planning, and in the financial forecasting, and again, scoping the project to see what we could afford to build, how much debt we could service, how much more we needed to raise from private foundations and, and uh, private contr contributions. And um, that's kind of exactly where we're at right now and still in the learning process. And um, But our board got to really learn about how this whole operation might work and has given the go-ahead to continue to stay the course and keep looking into this as one of the major ways that we can pull off this development. Great, thank you, Michelle. And you know, I think you're highlighting something that we say all the time, which is that we know that the roots of poor health and poverty are the same, and so CDFIs are an excellent partner in the kind of work that you're doing. Um, Jay, how about you? How have you engaged with CDFIs over the past year, and where do you see these partnerships going? I think in many ways our experiences are similar to Michelle's. Um, I think kind of, this is kind of a starting point. You know, we are a community development organization. CDFIs are community development finance institutions. So clearly there's a natural partnership from the get-go. We're both, or I should say, our primary uh, CDFI partner, a group called Common Capital, are based in the same community that we're in. Uh, they are in Western Massachusetts and they understand the types of challenges that we face intimately. They're, they're not, and it's not to disparage uh, private lenders, we certainly need them, um, but, but they really are different than a kind of an objective third party lender who's only looking at your pro forma to see if it works. They're in there, you know, in the trenches with us. Uh, and just kind of, you know, establishing why that's so critical for us if it's not obvious, you know, to our participants. Uh, the challenge that we face in financing a you know, supermarket in the community that we're speaking of is really multifold. First of all, of course, it is a low income area. So if we're looking to attract in a uh, an operator, particularly a chain operator, as uh, you know, is often the case, they're, they're looking at rooftops, they're looking at the income levels, and this is an area where the return is going to be uh, perhaps less aggressive than you might find in a more affluent area. So basically that's gonna impact the rent that we could possibly charge. It's gonna impact the potential revenue from that store. So that's a significant part of the challenge. Uh, we are a weak market. Uh, although we have a lot of great initiatives going on, overall this does remain a weak market in the Springfield area. However, we're still in Massachusetts, which is a high cost area when it comes to development. So essentially what we have is a gap between uh, what it's gonna to cost to develop the store and finance it and what the expected revenues are. So if it wasn't obvious, that's the challenge that we face. And that's really where our CDFI partners have become so critical. Helping us figure out how to bridge that gap. And, and I say helping to figure this out, I mean, you know, right at the table with us. So the ways in which that's happened, first of all, is they have introduced us to other CDFIs that are operating at a national or a regional level, hugely helpful. And they've helped work with us as well as introduce us to other significant partners that could help to finance this project. So that's absolutely critical for us. And, and there was a mention earlier about new markets tax credits. New markets tax credits are going to be critical to the success of this project. And for those who have ever dealt with it, that's an enormously complicated 
federal program. It's great in that it brings a significant infusion of essentially free equity into the project, but getting there is extremely difficult and complex. For us, we're a development corporation. We're not a finance institution, although we're learning more as we go. Um, there's no way that we could pursue the types of financing that we're looking at with our partner who really understands how these mechanisms work. So through our local CDFI, we have also brought in, as I said earlier, these national regional partners who have specific expertise in that, that area, not only in new market tax credits generally, but in using new market tax credits to actually help finance urban grocery stores in low income areas. That's an enormous uh, experience that we could not replicate otherwise. So that's been hugely advantageous for us. And as we have kind of gone through the different scenarios, we've, we've evolved from focusing on attracting a chain operator to looking more closely at the concept of building up a smaller local operator. That introduces a whole host of different challenges when it comes to financing Kind of once again, you know, our local CDFI partner, as well as our national major ones, have been right there with us. Okay, now we have a new set of challenges. How do we figure those out? How, and what are some other resources that we can access? So for us, it's really been an invaluable partnership in this initiative, as well as in other initiatives that we're undertaking. Great. Thank you, Jay. So Jennifer, how does your experience with CDFI compare with Michelle and Jay's? What's been unique about Harris County's growing relationship with regional and national CDFIs? Well, Michelle and Jay's story could easily have been the Harris County story. I was smiling to myself as I was listening to them. Uh, just like Michelle, our relationship with our CDFI partner began at OFN as well. And that partner is actually a Texas-based CDFI called People Fund. Uh, but we also went through an interview process and interviewed several uh, local, state, um, and national CDFIs as we were launching our project. And uh, in fact, the, the primary author on our business plan is a former community development offer, officer for a local CDFI, which has been a fantastic opportunity. We've learned so much from that combination of a local CDFI perspective and a, a statewide CDFI perspective. And then like Jay, one of our CDFI partners is helping direct finance to the project. So um, I believe our stories are very similar and, and it's interesting to hear that, uh, that similarity um, from, from here in Harris County. Um, what has been unique about these new relationships from my perspective is the role that CDFIs have played in helping us frame as well as finance the work. We had always suspected, as Colby has been making reference, that public health, health equity, and community development share common space. But hearing it articulated firsthand from our local, regional, and national CDFIs has helped bake it in as part of our project DNA. So, for example, uh, we no longer stop at food access or food security when describing the benefits of our farm. Instead, we also em emphasize that investments in our build farm are also investments in new jobs, new job training, wealth creation, and a more equitable economy in this disinvested neighborhood. We've uh, integrated this new narrative throughout our business plan, and exactly as it has sounded for both Jay and Michelle, it's opened up so many new partners and opportunities as a result of infusing the CDFI perspective into our public health and health equity work. Along the way, um, there's been another benefit to us. The CDFIs have made us here in public health so much more financing savvy. <laughs> uh, we now have a far better understanding of the federal policies that drive community reinvestment, of the intermediary role that CDFIs and CDCs play in this area, how their goals address structural determinants of health, such as poverty and housing that we as a health department are also interested in, and then all of the opportunities that exist to connect CDFIs and CDC funding to our local partners and projects, beginning with Build and Beyond. Great, Jennifer, thank you. Those were great, um, great descriptions of your partnerships. And, you know, we have a few resources online I just want to mention quickly um, to help kind of facilitate this cross-sector language um, that we're all using. One is our Jargon Buster, um, and I think there's a link to that in our chat box now um, that helps to walk through some of these language differences across sectors. We also have a long-form essay as part of our Crosswalk essay series on Medium also available on our website, Affordable 
um, I'm sorry, at healthy, buildhealthyplaces.org. And this is about um, how CDFIs are investing in Native uh, Native American communities as well. So I think an interesting uh, resource for all of you. I mentioned that we received a number of resources, uh, a number of questions prior to the event. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to start with a couple of those first, and then we'll move to questions from all of you. Um, so I want to turn to our audience in just a minute. And please keep sharing your questions using the chat box on your right or uh, via Twitter at the hashtag Network Commons. Um, but just to start quickly with some of the pre-submitted questions, um, the first one is, uh, what would you do differently with your partnership? Um, who do you wish was at the table earlier in the process? And I'm going to start with Jay um, first to say a few words. I think there's a few things that we would do differently. And I think first and foremost, while we did have uh, strong community-based uh, partner organizations, which were extremely helpful in driving the process forward, um, I, I think what I would really do differently is think about the project more from the perspective of, I would say, a conventional for-profit retailer. Uh, if I were Procter & Gamble and I were launching a new product, uh, I would spend a whole lot of time understanding people's preferences, understanding their re reactions, their responses. We would do focus groups. I'm sure we would do surveys. There'd be a, you know, a whole host of different ways that we would go about uh, basically trying to understand what the public wants and how they might react to what we're offering. Uh, so as I said, while we did work with community-based organizations, we really didn't do uh, as much grassroots, on-the-ground outreach and engagement of the community we're seeking to serve. Uh, and I think that would have been extremely helpful, not only in building support within the community, but in making sure that the actual product, the, the actual supermarket product that we're hoping to deliver really does meet their needs and expectations. So that, I think, is critical. Secondly, and as time went on, we did add in more partners and build them more closely. I think bringing in early in the project some of the key institutional partners, um, such as our local hospitals, would have been extremely helpful from the get-go. Now, those are our folks who are now a part of the conversation and have come on board. Uh, but a little that was less true at the very beginning. And that would have, I think, manipulate uh, the health lens on this project as well as perhaps helping us access some different resources and the same thing would be true for some other key institutional players including some that may seem a little non-traditional or not quite as involved such as local area colleges great um and Jennifer, you mentioned that um, you know having a CDFI partner in the beginning would be useful. Um, can you speak a little bit more about who else you would have wished um, had been at the table earlier in the process? Absolutely. It's, again, funny how um, there are so many alignments with our stories, and I, I couldn't agree more with Jay. Uh, for our Build Health Challenge, I think we would have benefited from having additional commercial partners at the table to apply that private sector perspective on the work that we're doing, specifically commercial partners that are involved in food access, such as national grocery store chains, corner stores, dollar stores, etc. Their knowledge of the marketplace and of the many technical elements involved in a food system such as procurement and transport would help us build an even more robust and sustainable food system and we we too are now exploring bringing them more um, on board and at the table um, but when I first uh, heard this question I, I, I chuckled to myself because I would have wanted a CDFI at the table from the beginning um, and uh, we as a local health department had always worked closely with the CDCs in our county um, but joining forces for the first time that we had a CDFI as an official partner and as you know CDCs and CDFIs have uniquely different perspectives and roles and tools so I, I, I also think having them both at the table um, is a benefit to upstream community health improvement efforts like BUILD. Great and for those of you um, who are 
new to the language of CDFIs and CDCs, those are also in our jargon buster online. So I just wanted to point that to you as well. But CDCs in this in this context, as you've heard, is Community Development Corporation, um, not not the uh, Centers for Disease Prevention. <laughs> so that question comes up a lot. Um, Michelle, let me actually ask you. This is a slightly different question, but I'm wondering if you could speak to, you know, did the marriage of a CDFI seem natural or forced when the relationship first started? And, and who brought you together? I would say that it, it was very uh, organic. So really what it what brought us together was going to the OFN conference and starting to get to know the many national CDFIs that I just didn't even know existed. And um, being given lots of names of potential consultants and legal firms and the accounting firms that they work with that have this unique kind of set of skills and experiences. So, um, and we went through a really long courting process, I guess you could say, if you're gonna characterize it as a marriage. And those were those really <laughs> extensive interviews. And um, again, we, we used those to continue learning about what we were starting to explore. And then when we finally did choose Capital Link, one of the reasons for that was that Capital Link has worked exclusively with federally qualified health centers like ours. And at first that gave us a little bit of pause because we were thinking that they've only helped build health centers and that we are not building a health center, we're building everything but a health center. But they quickly assured us that they've done lots of other kinds of projects that pair a FQHC with building a drugstore or building housing or building an educational uh, entity. So we learned that they have much more capability and scope than we had previously thought. thought. And the other advantage to going with Capital Inc. was they knew that we had a consumer-based board of directors who would need to be assured that this was a viable route for us to pursue, that we could be eligible and competitive in this um, endeavor and knew that they would need to spend time with our board educating all of us at the same time about how to do this work or how to at least pursue it and what the risks were, how to protect our organization, uh, creating a separate entity and um, basically leveraging the relationships that we have. One of our strengths, you know, based on your previous question, Colby, is we did have a whole lot of the grassroots community engagement and we have great health partners in our uh, Presbyterian healthcare system and, um, and others. And where we were really lacking, what I wish we had been able to achieve earlier was the government buy-in. Because we've been getting a little bit of capital outlay dollars for this project and we could have leveraged those dollars, especially in this kind of a transaction. And yet they don't see us as economic development. And as much as we've tried to reframe, like Jennifer was saying, that this is not just about health, this is about economic health just as much. Um, our capital outlay has been line item vetoed by the governor. And the reason given was that it doesn't create jobs. And it's like, yes, it does create jobs. That's and it creates jobs for the people who need them the most and in the only sector that's growing. So um, that's where we could have used some more uh, involvement earlier was helping the government see, and especially the governor's office, that this was a worthy investment and that it could be leveraged and bring in resources from out of state that previously have not been tapped. Great, thank you, Michelle. And I wanted to let folks know, so we just um, became aware that the chat box, it doesn't look like that's working properly. So anything that's been chatted through um, from us in terms of links will be sent out separately in an email. And um, you can still submit your questions via Twitter. So please do continue to do that. And our apologies for the technology um, glitch, but we'll just keep going. Um, we do have, like I said, 65 questions that I come in in advance. And so um, I wanted to actually move um, to Jennifer, if you could say a few words about the same question, about the sort of the marriage of CDFIs with your organization um, in this work and if that felt forced and sort of how did the partnerships uh, come about? Absolutely. Um, 
I agree with uh, with Michelle. Our marriage with our CDFA partner seemed very natural as well. I think it helped that the relationship began at OFN. We had our first date there, as you said, um, which was very proactive in linking uh, build partnerships to the CDFIs in their area. I think it also helps that there's been a group growing understanding in both public health and community development that our goals are the same. We may use different language or apply different terminology and the jargon buster is fantastic for that, uh, to put a plug in for it, but our end game is the same, especially when viewed through the lens of health equity. I think another aspect that makes the marriage strong is our mutual focus on place. For very obvious reasons, both public health and community development are often working in the same cities, in the same neighborhoods in those cities, and that geographic commonality can also be a starting point for a new collaboration so that the, uh, the opportunities are also identified very organically and move forward organically because we're working in the same geographic locations. Great. Jennifer, thank you. And Jay, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the same topic. And then also just sort of get us started talking about maybe some of the challenges that you've run into through this process. The challenges are many. Um, <laughs> for, for us, it, you know, our, our alignment with our you know, local CDFI was, was very natural. And um, it began really right off the bat for us because they were there. Essentially, they were at the table pretty much from the get go. Um, as soon as and it kind of comes back to the fact that they were already rooted in the community. They already uh, understood the issues and challenges that we were focused on really from the very beginning when this became a project, um, the supermarket project, it was already on their radar. So, that, so for us, that was enormously helpful. And we had a number of conversations along the way as to how, what kind of a role might they play? How could they uh, help support the effort? And in fact, they did very directly, um, you know, most, most recently by providing with us, by providing with some working capital, which is, you know, really tremendous because when you're very early stage in a project like this, um, finding any kind of capital to support pre-development is extremely challenging. So kind of back to talking about the challenges, um, once you reach the point where you have an operator on board, that operator is viable, you've got your performance together, you've got a project that you can show works. Uh, and of course that requires bringing in and lining up all your different funding sources. At that point, obviously it's a, it's a whole lot easier to finance it. Not to say that it isn't really difficult to kind of build that pyramid, but once you have financing is, it is at that point far less of a challenge early stage where we are finding the financing and the funding to help get you there um, really is significant. So for us, that meant, first of all, assembling the site. We had a significant amount of property acquisition that we had to do. We pulled together about four and a half acres total, which in our area, of course, is multiple parcels and property. There were some demolitions that had to take place. There was site work, uh, environmental review, preliminary engineering, all of these kinds of pre-development costs that we had to incur uh, that, you know, frankly, you just can't finance. Now, we were successful in obtaining some grants uh, early on, which helped us enormously, but getting that kind of line of credit very early on from a sympathetic lender um, w w was really beneficial. And as we mentioned earlier, helping us to tap into and plug into other resources that we can take advantage of to kind of help move this project along. Uh, so for us, the challenges are many. Um, the most significant challenge really for us is a little less directly on the funding or financing side. It, it, it has been the challenge in attracting an operator. Um, so far, although we have uh, kind of done a lot of dating, to use an earlier analogy, uh, with some of the larger uh, regional chains, uh, at this point we have not succeeded in attracting that larger chain operator willing to open up a smaller footprint store within a very low income area. Uh, so we have increasingly starting to look at other models. Uh, again, our CDFI partner has been very helpful with that. Uh, in, in part, they or some of the other partners that they've introduced us to, the national and our regional CDFIs, have had that same experience. So that's been enormously beneficial. So what we have, as I mentioned earlier, been more focused on is the concept of scaling up the smaller operator. 
challenge there is that the smaller operators typically do not have the kind of resources that a national or a regional chain does. So from the perspective of a lender, uh, a lease with a smaller operator is not nearly as valuable. It's not as bankable uh, as obviously a lease with a larger operator. Very often, and you've probably seen this in other areas where there is a vacant uh, former supermarket, uh, very often they're sitting there paying rent, even if it's vacant, because they know that they're liable for those lease payments and they're not judgment proof, as unfortunately many small operators are. So how do we now figure out how to finance uh, under a scenario where we don't have that type of a partner with that kind of strength. So for us, this has really been, of course, a learning experience, but having somebody really walk through this with us, through all of the ups and downs and for helping us navigate uh, a very complex financing world, is it, just a tremendous added value to our project. Thanks, Jay. And we'll just continue the theme of challenges for a minute. Um, and so, uh, Michelle, why don't we go to you and then Jennifer uh, speak a few, speak a little bit about what you've encountered along the way. Well, I would echo that the pre-development process has been a challenge. Um, we, the other big challenge, obviously, is raising enough private capital to be able to leverage in any kind of a uh, a lending transaction, including new market tax credits, so that we can really take advantage of that. We had some good news uh, last week. We just got awarded a EDA grant, Economic Development Assistance, from the US Department of Commerce. So that's going to go a long way to help us get the leverage funds together. And it presents another challenge in terms of who gets first mortgage on our property, who gets second, how do you structure the transaction so that so many different players can participate. Um, in addition to that, we're really having to look through ourselves to our future tenants to, to really see their financial health and their ability to, um, to be able to make the lease payments so that we can make our debt payments. So, you know, we're working with pretty new startups. And for example, working with a charter school, they're in their fourth year, but they don't have the number of students that they will have eventually, especially when they get their permanent campus right next to us. Um, so we're having to really make the case that this is a viable school, that it's going to grow, and that they'll generate enough lease payment assistance through the student population to be able to pay the lease payments. And um, so things like that, and looking at the farm and food hub operator, which is not scaled up as big as it needs to be yet. And part of that is because they lack the space. So, you know, it's the pro formas that are a big challenge and um, being able to really how to, how to structure the loans and legal questions that have popped up in terms of, can we have a lease purchase agreement or does it need to be a straight purchase or a, excuse me, a straight lease agreement, things like that, that um, we really have to go to the experts on new market tax credits, for example, because it's not just a typical legal question and, and there's no one in the state that we have found that has experience with the kind of questions we have. So we're really relying heavily on our CDFI partner to put us in touch with the right resource people. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. And, and Jennifer, how about you? Let's talk here a little bit about the challenges you've encountered. Sure. I think if you ask any Build Health Challenge awardee what their primary challenge has been, and you'll hear time. Uh, the Build Health Challenge Awards are for only two years, and they end next summer. So in our case, in Harris County, in that two-year period, we set out to create a complete new local food system in a neighborhood, including ground-up construction of a physical space. And many of the challenges Jay described were our challenges. The details of land and property acquisition, environmental assessments, not to mention design, build, construction, securing appropriate financing, staffing, governance, and the legal designations. We've had continuing ongoing uh, discussions with experts about whether our farm should be its own separate uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization or should it or should it be a um, public-private partnership or just a simple LLC and those conversations are still ongoing. All of these details take 
time, time to acquire land, time to secure financing, time to build, even time to submit ultimately your final legal paperwork to the Secretary of State. Um, in addition, many of these details are often moving all at the same time. And so you are contingent planning for multiple models all simultaneously. Our farm has explored um, a municipal public uh, uh, partnership model for the for the physical space. We've explored a, a private public partnership for the physical space. Now we're um, in dialogue potentially uh, with a school district space in terms of land and property. Um, so we've had to pivot our model more than once since the beginning of our project. So my advice, um, especially for community health improvement projects that include capital construction, whether that be a farm, a grocery store, affordable housing, even a clinic, is to afford yourself more time than you think you'll need to uh, finalize all of those details and to have contingency plans. So you can be nimble if or more likely when you have to adjust course in one of those models. That's super. And I think it segues nicely into, I think, a last question I want to ask each of you. And, and um, we are running short on time. So just maybe say in one or two sentences, I'd love to hear from each of you, what advice would you give to your counterparts in this space? So you each represent sort of a different sector. Um, what would you say, um, Michelle, to other health clinics looking to do the work, the kind of expansion project? that you've been you've undertaken I guess the advice I would give would be to frame it not only as a health intervention but as this economic intervention because that's what's really resonating with many of the um, partners with us because we're in such dire economic straits and um, I would echo what Jennifer said is that it's going to take an enormous amount of time and we don't have the capacity in-house to do all of this. So it's a whole lot of consulting with experts and others. And it's, it's a giant learning curve, it has been for us, but we think that it's well worth it. We're used to tackling community health problems and we know that that's complex and hard. And uh, so we haven't been stymied by this. And I would say you have to put your same determination into this kind of an approach as you do to tackling community health issues. Great, thank you. And Jennifer, anything that you would add to your comments about noting the time frame and, um, and putting in place contingency plans? Absolutely, I would add two things to that and it's uh, summarized in people and partnerships. I think um, sometimes we get very caught up in the details of project and financing and legal paperwork that um, we may not take as much time as is needed to engage with the people that we should be in partnership with to uh, design their health and economic future. So the community engagement aspect, I would say, is a very critical and important piece from the beginning of a project. And that means not just going to community when you need to uh, show them some, some blueprints and have a charrette, but it's, it's getting the community members and those residents and people with lived experience at the top of your organizational chart and truly making decisions about, about the project. Ultimately, projects like this need a, a strong consumer base. And, 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 where, and if we have not built that consumer base and met the needs of the community, then, then those projects can fail. And after all this work, we don't want that to happen. Second is that partnership. I would advise to build the cross-sector interdisciplinary partners from the beginning and lean on them. We have incredibly strong partners from hospital healthcare systems, from nonprofit organizations, from our academic community, of course, from local public health and community and economic development. And to, to establish their unique roles and processes from the beginning will help you lean on them through these tougher times. Um, our Build Health Challenge would never be accomplishing what it is accomplishing without all of those important and critical partners at the table. So people, engagement, with partnerships. Great, thanks Jennifer. And Jay, we'll give you the last word. Um, <laughs> if you could just in a, in a minute or less, tell us, tell us your words of advice here and then we'll, we'll close us out. I, I would say, see your project or initiative through the eyes of those who you're seeking to engage, which I know is challenging and I'll echo some earlier comments, but back in 2011, when we were kicking this off, we did a feasibility study, we had identified our site, and we thought, well, terrific, now 
where are the develop, you know, where are the grocery store operators? And what we've come to realize since then is when you look at this project from their perspective, it looks a whole lot different than it does <laughs> from ours. And that was something that kind of looking back now uh, would have been hugely valuable. So, so that would be my advice. Whatever your project or initiative is, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, coming from a, you know, a, a health clinic or it's a grocery store, understand what that ultimate user's uh, needs are and how they're going to view your initiative. Really great advice from all three of you. Thank you so much. Thank you to um, to our audience for the questions that came in in advance. Again, apologies for the chat box. There's always some mystery involved in the background, um, but we'll make sure we get uh, links posted and out to all of you. Um, and we will also continue to um, take questions. So please share your questions and comments via Twitter using the hashtag network comments. We'd love to hear suggestions for future events as well. Um, and please fill out our survey uh, by following the link in the chat box. I want to thank our speakers, Jennifer, Michelle, and Jay. Wonderful to have you today. And thank you for being part of the Joining Forces grant effort. It's so exciting to see what you have all been working on. Um, if you missed any portion of today's discussion, we'll post the highlights on our website, which is Build Healthy Places Network, and through the YouTube channel there. And if you're interested in learning more about the projects mentioned today, I just wanted to reiterate all of their blogs are on our website going into further detail. You can also check out um, more information on our online essay series, Crosswalk, as well as other resources available on our website. So if you're interested in learning more about cross-sector collaboration and would like to attend future events like this one, please sign up for our newsletter on our website. And thank you so much. See you next time. Really wonderful to have you all. Take care.